Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Monarchs in Motion, Understanding the Importance of Their Epic Migration. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Eric Ramirez. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Eric. Thank you so much, Rob, for that. Again, incredible presentation. So my name is Eric Ramirez. And today, again, I'm going to present something related to epic migrations. Remember, the last two webinars were about um, epic migrations in animal kingdom. Last one was about world sharks, and today, I, I can't, we, we cannot just rule out uh, monarch butterflies. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit of myself first. Um, the reason why I have this funny accent is because I'm Mexican, is Mexican if you already not noticed. And I was born in Mexico City, and when I was 18, I, I, I wanted to study something related to nature, so I moved to La Paz, where I studied marine biology. So before I continue, I want to say that um, this webinar is extra special because I have a lot of people from Mexico, family, friends, are connected to this webinar, and for me, that's fantastic. So um, after I graduated, I started to work in a genetic lab for two years, and I decided it was my time to move to other adventures. So I started to work as an expedition leader in La Paz. Uh, I guided trips to different places to see whales, uh, whale sharks, uh, sea lions, and different type of marine life. But in 2021, uh, the destiny called my door and I answered. And uh, I started to work for Natural Habit Adventures, leading mostly monarch butterfly trips. So I decided to switch from my fins and snorkel mask to for my to my boots and also to wear a jacket and my binoculars. And I went to the mountains and I decided to uh, undertake this incredible uh, journey. Why monarchs? Why not? Monarchs are just incredible organisms and we're gonna discover this today. Starting with this, monarch butterflies are very unique and they're very easy to spot. Remember the term that we learned the last one? Conspicuous means that they're easy to spot because they have very um, uh, very huge shapes, or in this case, they have vivid colors. Monarch butterflies displays this one display these wonderful colors, black and orange. They have uh, their wings, they have two antennas, they have a very long mouth like that we're gonna call proboscis. This proboscis uh, is used to sip the, the the nectar of the plants and uh, this question is very very common when I'm guiding these trips in Mexico Eric what's the difference between a female and a male so basically this in the back wings these veins were running from the head to the tail to the tail to the back wings are veins um, are going to be thicker and in the males and the females and the males are going to be thinner and then we have two black spots who in other species are well known because they produce pheromones to attract the females. This is not really clear if it's a real function in monarch butterflies. So um, the art of these guys, yes, these colors in nature are sending a message to different predators and they're sending this, dangerous. Um, danger, please don't eat me. Oh, you will suffer the consequences. Here we have the monarch butterfly, but there are other different butterflies who also are disguising using the same color pattern to camouflage, to send the same message to the predators. I'm poisonous, all right? So here amongst these, the soldier, the queen and the visor, the visor is the one that looks more alike the monarch butterfly, of course. Um, so I'm going a little bit too fast because I said that there are toxins, there are poisonous so indeed they are but i'm gonna tell you why in a few slides so food habits um we have in monarch butterflies uh, different stages because they have a very interesting life cycle but this adult that we already know um it's going to feed upon the nectar of the flowers when when there are caterpillars uh the caterpillars will feed upon the um, the, the leaves of the, of the milkweed. So speaking about milkweed, I know they look fantastic. They're precious, but also they're obnoxious. 
don't they don't have really good taste and the reason is because when they are in this caterpillar stage the caterpillars are going to feed upon the leaves of the milkweed so eric what what is milkweed it's a type of plant that inhabits north america and we have around more than 100 different species some of them they have um, all the, the milk we have these very particular uh, chemical compounds that we call them, uh, they are alkaloids, but we call them cardiac glycosides. So cardiac glycosides are very toxic for different species because they affect directly the sodium potassium bump, which is really, really useful for the muscles of many vertebrates. So monoguaracas have handled this perfect. They're these compounds are not harming monarch butterflies. Instead, they just took them to their bodies and like in a way to, uh, like as, as a mechanism effects to avoid predators. That's absolutely incredible adaptations. So apparently this blue jay didn't get the memo that the monarch butterflies were toxic, right? So we have an example of when a uh, bird in this case feeding upon the monarchs they will immediately vomit, vomit the monarch because it has not a good taste and also it's not good for, for the health of this, uh, in this case, this blue jay. So um, it, it is well known that monarchs are, um, a lot of people believe that monarchs, monarch butterflies are exclusive from the Americas, but it is not. They actually, a long time ago, we're talking about millions of years ago, they were originated from the ancestor who inhabits in, in the Central and, and South America. And then they little by little spread out to the north, to different, or, uh, different areas. But the Ice Age limited their distribution to the to north of Mexico, and also south of, of US. As soon as the glacier, as soon as all these ice were melted, they were following, guess what? milkweed because the milkweed start to distribute more to the north and these two i'm, I'm going to repeat constantly throughout this presentation milkweed and monarch, monarch butterflies are linked together because their history of life is it, it, it is considered as, as as a parallel evolutionary um relationship that they have so little by little Monarch butterflies start to migrate to other places, but this is not precisely like they decided one day to go to, for example, uh, the islands of the of the Pacific. Some scientists believe that they were taken by boats, by thunderstorms, or they were using different islands in the Pacific, like stepping stones, to arrive to other places, uh, making their um, amplifying their distribution. So yes, we have monarch butterflies in New Zealand, in Australia, in different islands like Samoa, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, and also in, in, in Africa, in Morocco, in Spain, in different islands uh, as well. So I told you before, monarch butterflies, they have a particular life cycle. We're going to call it metamorphosis. Metamorphosis implies a change. So we have four different stages. First one is the uh, the egg stage, and then we pass to through the caterpillar stage, and then we go to the chrysalis or pupa, and then we have finally the adult stage or imago. So everything starts with this, the mating process. So in this case, the monarch butterflies will mate, and the male is going to pass uh, to the female a uh, sac that we're gonna call a spermatophore. Spermatophore has it's a huge sack full of sperma, but also a lot of carbs. These carbs, this sugar is going to uh, provide energy to the female, but also it's going to stimulate the, the, the egg production inside. Uh, some scientists believe that males, males with a bigger spermatophore will um, pass this to the females and females will produce more and more and more eggs. So this is the size of it. It's a very, very tiny, it's just the size of the tip of the, of the of a pen. And the female will choose, guess what? Milkweed to lay the eggs. So it is very likely that the female will choose the, the under part of the leaf, but sometimes also on the flowers and also on the steam. It, it's, it, it just happens in nature. 
um, as well. So she will deposit these eggs and then after six or seven days, depending on the temperature, because temperature plays an important role in nature, uh, the egg will hatch. And then we will have this, a very tiny little larva, which is going to start to feed upon the eggshell because nothing is wasted in nature. So uh, I want to call these friends as, as a little feeder machines. They're just basically feeding for the next 20 days and they will feed and they will grow. But unfortunately, in a certain stage of this growing process, the body is not big enough to contain all this mass. So they must mold their skin, the old skin or shape the skin. So uh, we will have five different periods where they are going to be molting and we call this uh, instars. So this is how it looks like when uh, a caterpillar is, is molting its skin. So if you really notice, also a caterpillar has a funny colors, right? Black, white, and yellow are also warning colors in nature. This caterpillar is already taking the alkaloids, this chemical compounds, which is going to be passed to the, to the adult stage. So uh, this is interesting because in nature we have an evolutionary race where uh, predators and prey are evolving uh, parallel, very, very close. But we're going to talk about this in another in another webinar for sure because it's a very long topic. So after 21 days, more or less, depending on the temperature, the the caterpillar is going to move out of the of the of the milkweed zone and is going to climb up to the branch. In this case, we have a perfect example, and the caterpillar is going to hang up in a upside down like in a gay shape to perform the last molting and this is interesting because with the mouth previously the 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 caterpillar already uh produced a silica in order to make a silk silica pad and here in the parallel legs um a very funny structure is produced we're gonna we're gonna call it cream master so the cream master is going to stop the silica pad in order to be hung upside upside down in a perfect shape. And at the end, what we have left is this beautiful chrysalis or chrysalida. So I like to see things in a very, very small detail because they can tell you a lot. So this is a cream master and this is a silica pad. So I was checking some pictures of um, electron microscope and check this out. This is fantastic. This is for me like a natural velcro this is a cream master and this is the silk body can you see how they things are attached so this is just geek stuff but i like to to put it because these things are making everything more and more uh, interesting um so then for the next uh, 10 14 days um the chrysalis is going to change everything is going to melt inside except for some specialized cells and these cells are going to be arranged in a certain way in order to produce the structures of the adult um, uh, monarch butterfly. So this happens as after 14 days, the monarch is ready to close. And this is crucial because the first hour, the, the wings have to be, have to, get, have, have to get dried in order to be ready to fly. And after one hour, we have the fourth life stage, the butterfly. I know that I went really fast, and if you have questions, you can uh, you can ask me at the end, or you can also you can pass with you my email. You can uh, ask me because this is a very long topic. So uh, I'm gonna pass through my creation because uh, my creation is just an amazing phenomenon that happens in nature, but also in humans as well. But two of the mightiest migratory species, uh, without any doubt, are this. So in the left hand, we have uh, the Arctic tern. Arctic tern is considered as the animal that performs the, the largest migration in the world. So these guys are moving from the Arctic Circle to the Antarctic Circle uh, all the way around. So both ways, round trip. So these animals can, can like, travel around 35,000 miles. So this is just crazy. And we have here uh, monarch butterflies, they are the only insect who can perform, who can actually fly more than 3,000 miles in the animal kingdom. 
But I put these two organisms because they are different. We don't say in biology like one is not more uh, evolved than the other. We just say that they are different and they have suffered different adaptations and different uh, evolutionary process. But just imagine birds, they have more complex brain. They remember things. They, their senses are different than the monarch butterflies. And the monarch, fly, the monarch butterflies, they have a very antique nervous system, which doesn't allow them to, to keep a lot of memories. At least that's what we know, like the birds. So how do they perform this super long distance migration? And the question is, um, goes to what do they move? So I learned when I was a kid that don't fix something that is not broken, just leave it like that. But it's interesting to know that many animals or all the animals who are performing long distance migrations, they have to be well adapted. They have to have a lot of good skills. They have to prepare themselves, but also it is important that they acquired many adaptations, but these adaptations were not uh, they were not happening from one day to the other. It took them years, hundreds, thousands, you know, so used to, to actually um, to get better in this activity, which is migration. So what happened with the, with the monarch butterfly uh, population that we have in North America? Well, the migration is triggered by the decrease of the day and lead and the temperature. Temperature plays an important role again. So as soon as it drops, this is a signal for the monarch butterflies that they must, must move. Monarchs, as many insects, are really sensitive to what's going on around, especially temperature, pressure, and light. And they start to uh, fill up their bodies. They store large amounts of fat because they're preparing themselves to move southward. Also, the milkweed starts to die because, remember, we have season in the north, we have winter. Well, they, they, we have autumn, plants, they don't have enough resources to continue uh, living in, under those conditions. Conditions are changing, scarce of resources. And I forget to mention, hmm, what is the lifespan of a normal monarch butterfly? And the lifespan is, or how do they, how much do they live? We're talking about two or six weeks. So in the case of the monarch butterflies who travel from Canada to Mexico, it's five more times. They can live between seven and nine months. Nine months. But how do they extend this, this, this lifespan? And the answer is this, because they remain sexual immature. So remember all the cycle. So as soon as they, they get to the adult stage, they start to produce, in the case of the female eggs, in the case of the male sperma, and they have the sexual organs, and they are ready to mate because time is running. But in the case of the sexual, uh, in the case of the of this, the Methuselah generation, which is going to live between six and seven and nine months, they remain immature because one of the most important um, um, hormone that is produced, which is the juvenile hormone, is not produced by the organ uh, that they have which is corporal tata. So this organ is not producing this hormone, so they're not producing uh, any, any, any sexual organs. That means that they will remain sexually mature. Why? Because the temperature is reducing all this metabolic uh, action in their body. So when they fly to Mexico, they were right to this beautiful forest up in the mountains. And we like to say that this place has the perfect conditions uh, for, for the monarch butterflies because it has a perfect altitude, it has a perfect temperature, not too cold, not too warm, and we call this the Goldilocks place. Goldilocks means that everything is perfect uh, for, for, for in, the, in this case for the monarch butterflies. So they will remain here from November to March, and then on March the temperature will, will rise back again, and then they will start to produce this juvenile hormone, they will start to produce the, the sexual organs, they will mate, and they will start the journey back to the north. So we have here a beautiful map. In this case, we have the eastern population of monarch butterflies, and then we have the western population. One goes 
the eastern population goes to Mexico to overwinter, and the one in the western overwinters in 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 California. All right. So this is how it works. So the temperature decreases, same as the day length, and then the monarch butterflies start to migrate southward. Okay, here they check the passport in the border, just kidding, and then they move to um, to the mountains of Mexico. And then when the temperature rises in the spring, they move back to US and then they will continue the journey until they reach Canada back again. All right, so this is interesting because this situation didn't, don't, doesn't happen in one generation. It takes more than between four and five generations to complete the whole cycle. Something is very hard to understand these topics, so I want to be very, very, I try to be very clear. So we have here the generation who migrates on, on fall to Mexico, okay? They stay here from November to, until March, and then they will, they, will, they will mate, and only, most likely, only the females will move back to, to the north. And then here, they will be searching for milkweed, and they will, they will deposit their eggs, they will lay the eggs on the, on the milkweed, and this generation will die, and then a new one, a new, the first generation will appear, and then they will, they will make the whole cycle. Egg stage, uh, caterpillar, chrysalis, out stage, they will mate, and then they will continue to moving forward to northward to, to Canada. And this will take between three and four or four generations until they finally reach here, uh, um, the zone in, in Canada. And as soon as the temperature decreases, they will the, the last generation who were born here they will start to move southward back again, and the cycle will be repeated. Yeah. So the reason why they do this is basically they're they chasing the the milkweed because during the winter the, the milkweed dies, and during the spring and summer basically the milkweed is blooming, and they need milkweed, otherwise they won't be able to uh, lay the eggs. And, and and so on. So this is how basically it works. Okay, they were just following the buildweed to this uh, places in the north. All right. So good question is Eric. How do we know which route the monarch butterflies are taking? Hmm, it is a very complicated question to be answered because um, in the past, I'm talking about in the seventies, doctor. Canadian doctor Fred Orcord, who was the one who discovered the overwintering grounds in Mexico, he started this um, this project of tagging monarch butterflies to know to see if they can recapture this tag, so they can they can figure out where they were overwintering. And since then, a lot of people, a lot of volunteers, a lot of people involved with monarch monarch watch, for example, are continuing this incredible task, tagging many, many monarchs. The problem with it, with it, with the monarchs, the, with the, with the tag, is that you need to recapture this tag. You need to get the tag in order to get the information. Otherwise, it it be it will be completely oblivion. So, um, but the truth is that some scientists are now. Uh, developing new, new, uh, new technologies like this in Texas. Uh, also, some scientists from Mexico, from Yunnan, uh, they they designed this microchip, which is like a jet bag that's attached to the back of the of the monarch butterflies. And these little devices basically just recording temperature and, and latitude, altitude, um, which is it is not the best, but it's what we have. And a lot of people ask me, Eric, why don't they just place a GPS? Yeah, they could place a GPS, but that will be very uncomfortable for an animal that doesn't weigh more than half of, 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 of ground. They need to get a very, very tiny light weight, light, uh, weight um, uh, devices. And a GPS is very, very, very heavy for them, of course. So maybe in the future, this is a very first step, good step. Maybe in the future, future there will be more and more uh, new technologies who uh, enables to, us to follow the original route. So, treats to the monarch butterflies. Um, this is a very, very sensitive topic, and and I, I want to go a little bit deep on this because uh, habitat loss could be one of the most important threat for the monarch butterflies because not only in Mexico, also in US, things are happening. Um, in the past, the countries there were uh, 
they were throwing the ball, they were tossing the, the ball like Mexico, you're not doing anything to protect the monarch butterflies. And Mexico say, was saying to you, as, yes, but you're not protecting their, the migratory routes. And, and, the, and, um, and the truth is that uh, in the past, no one was doing anything. Um, monarchs, they need the, the forest in the overwintering grounds in order to settle during the winter. And if there are not enough um, trees, if the forests are not healthy enough, the monarchs will perish. Also, it's really important to protect the migratory route. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the route that, that is following by the monarch birds where they actually are feeding upon the, the nectar. But what happens if we exchange, we substitute, replace uh, for example, prairies full, full of 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 of, of plants with agricultural fields. I mean, it's going to be very hard for them to fill in off their bodies, and then they won't make it to Mexico as well. Also, climate change is an important cul culprit in this case because uh, we have not seen how cities are getting warmer. Droughts are just in any in every corner or we have strong uh, strong tropical uh, storms, or we have more um, uh, uh, freezing events in different cities, we have more snow. So this is actually something that is driving crazy the monarch population in, in the world. Monarchs, they can survive um, in cold environments as long as they're not wet. And, and one of the most important thing in Mexico, something that we have been dealing with since a long time ago, is illegal logging. Uh, people are using the natural resources is completely fair. We shouldn't say like they are not allowed to uh, make the use of these natural resources, but it has to be controlled somehow, especially in these places where animals are spending their winter. So this was a very common mistake before because in 2022, the, the International Union of Conservation published this, this, this note that the migratory monarch butterfly was in danger. And a lot of people believe that the species by itself, the whole monarch butterflies were in danger. And this is not really what is, what is happening. Only the migratory, the the eastern population and the western population are, were in danger, all right? We need to separate because species, they can be inhabiting different places in the world, but they have different population and those have been treated in a different way. So in this case, uh, this was something that happened last year in 2023. They were not considered in danger anymore. They were placed as vulnerable, but that, that, that status is going to change this year because um, this is the tendency. This is this is the number of the hectare, hectares occupied by the monarchs because there are so many. We're talking about millions that it's impossible to count count each individual. We so we the scientists determine more like a cover zone. So here hectares occupied by monarchs started speaking since 1994, and then here we have. 2023, 2024. So there is like a tendency here. We have like a one big year with a lot of hectares occupied, and then we have fall, and there is like two years that are like the, the populations are raising, and then we have fall again, one, two, and three, good year, and then a fall. Unfortunately, the last season was the one that experienced one of the lowest numbers. Uh, historically speaking, and this is something that we need to be aware of. Um, locally for insects, the, the numbers could raise back again kind of easy because they produce a lot of eggs, the last one is really, really short, and they're very fertile, and this, this characteristic has happened now to, uh, to sustain the natural populations, all right? Uh, this is the western, well, the, sorry, I, I, this is the um, totally area occupied by, in, at the overwinter uh, sites in Mexico. Here we have the western monarch count. So in California, for example, it's more like stable, let's say, but here between 2018 and 2020 something happened and they could barely count at 
like no more than 2,000 Monaco tokens. That was not really good that year. And people thought that they were this close to completely be whipped out. So in 2023, the populations were better. So we hope that the next year, uh, the, the populations will um, stay here or increase. So um, we have this amazing scientist. Um, he's from, he was from the United States and his name was Lincoln Brower. So Lincoln Brower advocate a lot for the monarch butterfly populations, not only in Mexico, also in US. He dedicated 50 years of his life to study monarch butterflies. And he was going from one place to another, um, just talking about monarch butterflies and seeking uh, uh, help to, 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 to protect them. And this is interesting because I was reading that in a conference that he was given, um, someone dared to ask why we should protect monarch butterflies and everybody at the room stared at him like wow how dare you and he answered very polite why we should protect the monarch the Mona Lisa I mean Mona Lisa is just a piece of paper with paint monarch butterflies are more than that are pollinators and we cannot conceive the life without them so that, that leads me to the next topic what is the real importance of the monarch butterflies why we should protect them. Um, here we have um, some of the reasons. First, because they're pollinators. Second, they're good sources of food for the food chain. They bring benefits for local communities. They have been used as an instrument to sensibilize people about our planet. And also they are used as an umbrella species. I'm gonna go very specific, I uh, wanna talk about about this in the next slide. So pollinators, um, one third part of what you eat comes from the more pollinator action. So this is just incredible. Imagine life without bees, without bats, without butterflies, moths, name it. We, we, we couldn't have access to a different type of food. So even although monarch butterflies are not the most important pollinators, they're indeed really important for all of us because Remember, they, are, they, they have the ability to migrate. So imagine the map that I just placed you before, I put you, I showed you before, how they are sweeping from the north to the south, pollinating all these plants. Without this action, these plants wouldn't be pollinated. So yes, they're indeed really good pollinators. Here, yeah, indeed someone has to eat. So in this case, in the overwintering areas, uh, these three little fellows, they rely upon the monarch butterflies. So remember that monarch butterflies are toxic. Okay, these organisms also handle really well the alkalis, the toxicity of the monarch butterflies. So we have here the black-headed grosbeak, black, black, uh, uh, the grosbeak here, the black black oriole, and the black-eared mouse. These guys are responsible for 20% of the mortality of the monarch butterflies in Mexico, 20%, that's a lot. So imagine that one day the monarchs, they just don't show up. What happened with to these organisms? They would just not survive during the winter because during the winter, the resources are very scarce. Of course, local communities are getting so much profit out of this, but it wasn't like this before. It took a lot of work with the, with the with the local communities and the government and the scientific community in order to get to the agreement that they must protect this incredible heritage that they have for the future. Because we know that we, if we don't protect it, our natural resources, we will jeopardize the future generations. But they must be convinced that this is the way, this is the route. And believe me, it is a long, long route to take. Um, this is a beautiful mural that we have in Mangangeo. This is the place where we stay during our itinerary, our itinerary with NADHAP. And this is so beautiful because every single person who walks over this street, this is just a, a daily reminder that how monarchs are, we, how, how monarchs are important in, 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 our, in our lifestyle. I mean, uh, they're pretty, they're pollinators, but also they are used by many people like us to sensibilize people. Because monarch butterflies represents a lot of strength, 
a lot of uh, resilience, power, adaptations. So we can use this, the example of the monarch butterfly, and we can use it just to show people how, it, like, if we want to continue seeing this beautiful and majestic event phenomenon in nature, we should do more than just, you know, just recycle our stuff in, 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 in our places. I like to also talk about the importance of not use the single use plastic in my itineraries because I, I guess like this is the perfect place to do it. I mean, you can do a lot. You can teach kids, you can uh, talk to adults, but also you can get information from locals as well. So this is like a win-win relationship. And of course, I told you about umbrella species. Umbrella species are really important because um, they act as literally as an umbrella, because if they are, if the scientists protect, this is the government protects uh, a specific area. In this case, we we we're talking about monarch butterfly biosphere reserve. Um, everything that is here is going to be indeed protected as well. So here, for example, the presence of the monarch butterfly is bringing protection to birds, to insects, to plants, to vertebrates, to other organisms creating a great balance in this area. So that's why charismatic species like monarch butterflies, like whales and sharks are really important for conservation affairs. And um, I like also to talk about this because uh, as Mexicans, I feel very, very proud. Um, I was checking about the history of the monarch butterflies uh, in, 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 in Mexico. And I stumbled upon with this, incredible uh, information. Um, the Aztecs, in this case, we're gonna call them Mexicas is the right name. The, the Mexica Empire used to believe that the warriors represented the souls. Um, they, they were, uh, the, the monarch butterflies represented the souls of the warriors who have lost their lives in the battlefield. And according in the 16th century, Bernardino de Cesagún, a uh, Spanish um, con uh, conquered, he wrote, wrote that the, the Mexicas believed that the warriors, as soon as they died, they moved to, to, to Tonatiu. Tonatiu is considered as the, as the god of the sun. And then they stayed there for four years. As a reward, they were able to return to the world of the living as a monarch butterflies. And as a reward, they were able to sip the beautiful juices of Flower. So that's epic. That's fantastic. So after 200 years, uh, this other civilization in Mexico, the Toltecas, the, this is a very famous uh, archaeological site in Mexico, in, in, in Hidalgo. We have the Atlantis of, Atlantis of Tula. And here they have also monarch butterfly motifs. They also link the butterflies with the warriors. And uh, so we have seen how this tradition is is, is, is passing from one indigenous tribe to another. So it's just undoubtedly that uh, monarch butterflies are very present in, in, our, uh, in our history, in Mexico at least. And this is uh, uh, information that they didn't give it to you until now. Um, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but when the monarch butterflies arrive to, to Mexico, it matches with the day of the dead. How magical, how cool is it? That's why the colors, that's why a lot of people are tuned with, with the monarch butterfly motifs. And again, this tradition that the, the souls of our beloved ones are just transmitted to the monarch butterflies. And then as soon as they come here during the dead steals, intact in our culture. It's just very magical. And you can see this when you talk to our guests. Sometimes in, in the overwintering sites, they are just expecting to be contacted by contact by, by a monarch butterfly, just to say hi again to uh, someone who was not here, who's not here anymore. So just to finish this presentation, I want to go over this, 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 this question. What can we do to protect the monarch butterflies? We can do many things. First, we can educate ourselves. That's, that's, that's paramount. We can just read more about what's going on, not only here in Mexico, also in the US. Um, 
the importance of the monarch butterflies. We can also support uh, different uh, non-NGOs uh, as well. Some nonprofit organizations are doing fantastic searches. Uh, searches also Uni North or some more Watch. Uh, that's what, what we can do. Um, also habitat restoration. We, we, we cannot think that we're gonna uh, go outside and plant millions of plants. But what we can do is we're gonna start in our backyards, for example. We can plant some uh, flowers. We can plant also milkweed. But it's important that the milkweed that is going to be planted has to be native. And, and and we need to avoid to plant tropical milkweed as far as possible. Citizen science, of course, participate in different projects. Um, a lot of my guests um, have told me how how huge this movement is in, in US. To be honest, I wasn't not even aware about how big, how 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 deeply uh, aligned the people are in US in order to support. Uh, uh, citizen science. Um, also, we need to keep care of our agricultural practices, especially limiting mowing. Uh, mowing also, um, we need to stop using herbicides and and uh, um, and different chemical compounds are going to kill also insects as well. And not only for the monarchs, also for many other uh, creatures who are inhabited in these areas as well. So um, this is it. Uh, that was the presentation for today. I wanted to finish this 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 topic with this picture that I took um, two years ago, and I think this is a great representation of what of the three countries were involved: the monarch butterfly protection and conservation. We have here Canada, U.S., and Mexico. And for me, monarch for butterflies have enormous power to unite three countries in order to protect the monarch butterfly. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eric. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and if you're interested, and traveling with NatHab, you can visit our website at nathab.com and our investor specialist will be happy to help you out. All right, so let's get to some of these questions. So why do the monarch butterflies migrate to the mountains in Mexico instead of the valleys or some lower elevations? Um, this is interesting because um, remember what I told you about the Goldilocks places? Uh, this place has the right temperature in order to keep monarch butterflies immature. So, for example, um, if they move to places where the temperature is a little bit slightly more uh, warmer, um, they will start to produce their um, um, their their sexual organs. They will mate and they won't travel southward. And this is funny because this is something that is happening in Florida. We have a resident population in Florida. They have the perfect conditions, perfect weather, uh, midweek year round, and they're not migrating, they're not moving at all. So that's the reason why they move here, because they are immature and they can stay here uh, surviving from the from the winter in, uh, that is like in the north, of course. All right, great, thank you. Uh, yeah. How many different locations are there in Mexico uh, that have uh, the overwintering monarchs and are they all being protected oh it's interesting they're all being protected and we have 11 different sanctuaries and most uh, some of them they don't have so many monarch butterflies the places that we visit in in when we go there with nanhab are the ones who have the largest amount of monarch butterflies historically speaking yeah. great thank you um so do the western and eastern populations ever overlap or mix together oh that's a fantastic question and i was very adamant to prove that there were two different species and i was reading so many articles about this uh, scientists have used um, um genetic technology uh, genetic tools in order to see if there's some differences between both populations and they display slightly different changes in the in their in their bodies 
But guess what? Generically speaking, they are still the same. And I don't know if you check, I will, uh, well, I will move back to one of the, of the slides, this one. Yeah, this one. Because apparently, some of the Eastern population monarch butterflies are, when they are moving northward, they're either go to California, or when they're going southward from, from California, they're also moving to Mexico. Why? We don't know yet. But they're mixing, so that's why they are not actually different yet. Yeah. Great. Thank you for answering that one. Um, so, can you explain more about how the monarchs on their way back up north know where they're going? Oh, yes. Uh, it's just, it is a very tough question to be answered because despite there are already more like almost a thousand published articles related to monarch butterflies, there are still so many mysteries about them. And what, it, what they do, remember what I told you that the milkweed and the monarch butterflies are pretty much linked. They just follow in the route of the milkweed because they can, if they go to places where they don't have milk, where the, the milkweed is limited, they won't survive. So basically it's just following the, 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 the distribution of the milkweed. Uh -huh, gotcha. And that's why it's important to preserve all the milkweed that we have in the U.S. and Canada, too, I'm guessing. Exactly. That's paramount, for sure. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so what was the name of the man, the man that advocated for the monarchs? Oh, Lincoln Brower. How do you spell that last name? Lincoln Brower is B-R-O-W-E-R. Brower. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I know we have some people who uh, would like to look that up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do I support the local community and conservation efforts when I go on the Monarch expedition with NATHAB? Good question. So <laughs> we can practice a little bit of retail therapy. That's what we said. So a lot of locals are, a lot of local vendors are selling many craft thingies and the way how you can support it is just buying stuff and also sometimes we tell the guests that um, they can like everything is paid of course but if they want to support this um local communities they can buy more tickets just 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 for them that's that's the way that, that how we can do it yeah great thank you so do the migrating monarchs uh, that are returning to the wintering grounds, do they just disperse randomly or do they going to uh, their place of origin? No, it's a good question. Um, they go to the same places, the same uh, sanctuaries, but not to the exact same points. They scatter in all their area. And this is interesting because I asked this question to uh, a PhD professor uh and like if they have some preferences when they decided to move to mexico and she said like basically just like seeking for a place with a dense amount of 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 of, 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 of trees and also like which is like protected uh and, and that's it yeah but they, they like to move actually uh the last year was a little bit tough because they were a slightly further up and it was a little bit hard to, to, for us to, to catch them because they just prefer to be in, in this place. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Now we've got a couple of people who have uh, milkweed in their yards. Um, one person planted milkweed and hasn't seen any monarchs. And another one asks if you should cut the milkweed at certain times uh, so that the monarchs will migrate. Is, is that true? Yeah. So, okay. About the milkweed, um, it's, it's important that to, to be mentioned that the milkweed will have different amounts of alkaloids. So if the plant has a lot, it's too dangerous for the organism. If they don't have enough, is also not going to be suitable for the monarch butterfly. So just 
uh, I want to give a tip. Um, the three most common milkweeds, and these ones are like very, very used by monarchs, are the swamp milkweed, the butterfly bush, the butterfly weed, and the third one is the common, the common, the swamp, and the butter, butterfly. Yeah, and about cutting off the milkweed, this is. Um, this is for the tropical milkweed because it doesn't die and we need to cut it off because the tropical milkweed stores OE which is a parasite and this parasite will infect the monarch butterflies if we don't cut it off during the off season and again if we are planting for example tropical milkweed in places with good temperature we will retain the monarch butterflies because we will create we will create like small islands with suitable conditions for them and in the future they will they won't move back to the north they will stay there because they have good amount of, of, of milkweed year round they have right temperature why why should they bother they will stay there that's something that happened in 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 florida and this is something that the scientists were a little bit concerned that it was happening in, in california as well so which brings us to the next question how does the monarch know when it's time to return to mexico temperature <laughs> temperature definitely uh when they have to return to mexico is because um the temperature is, is is dropping down the decrease of the day late day length as well and we it's it's impossible to us to understand how sensitive the animals are um, but I was just reading something really novel that the monarch butterflies can detect the slightest variations of pressure in the air with the antennas. So imagine that. Imagine that they can like, mm, there's a slightly change. And those slight, slightly changes are triggering different expressions in, in, in their bodies. I mean, um, there's something that we, we, we um, scientists are now studying more effortlessly about epigenetics because it's how environment is affecting the expression of genes in our body so in, this is the perfect example how temperature is just expressing some genes in this migratory in the Methuselah generation in this uh, generation who's going to perform this long distance migration to mexico giving them the right tools the right adaptations to move that one i mean it's not that they were given they were already there but just the temperature is expressing this genes in the case of the, of the monarch butterflies. Great. Thanks for that answer. Unfortunately, that is going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for some closing comments. Thank you, Rob. So the only thing I want to I want to tell you is that um, I think um, we just need to look outside a little bit and take our time to realize how beautiful our world is. And if we are if, with this, I think we will create a sense of consciousness and this is going to be the first step in order to um to be more aware about the situation that's going on and and if you want to travel with us just as uh, rob said before there's a link there and i, I think this itinerary is very emotional very very emotional eric i want to thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today thank you and i'd also I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today as well. So if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at 800-543-8917 or send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Now join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including our registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.